Could Roma be the first Netflix film to take the Oscar for Best Picture? Will Green Book defy the critics and be the champion? Or perhaps my favourite, A Star Is Born, will live up to its hype. Thanks for joining us for our dissection of the Oscar nominations with Lisa Nesselson and myself. Now, Lisa, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for being here. Roma and The Favourite have 10 Oscar nominations each. That must mean they're good films, does it? <laughs> they are good. It's safe to say they are good. But come on, how important could the Academy Awards really be? I mean, at this point, they still don't have anyone to actually host the ceremony. Hey, maybe you could give them a hand. I mean, they say a billion people watch it, which means, you know, it's nothing compared to our audience. But uh, maybe you could help them out. You know, I did some fruit on the street interviews with apples and oranges, and they all agreed that Roma and The Favourite are completely different different kinds of cinematic endeavors, and therefore downright silly to compare, which is best. I think the favorite is thrillingly nasty and brilliantly acted. Olivia Coleman, uh, Emma Stone, and Rachel Weisz could not be better, and they all got acting nominations. Okay, well, let's take a look at the antics at court in the favorite. It is important to make new friends in court, is it not? You're so beautiful. Stop it, I, you mock me. If I were a man, I would ravish you. You have become close to Abigail. She is a viper. You're jealous. You must send Abigail away. I do not want to. Let's shoot something. <gasps> Sometimes it is hard to remember whether you have loaded the pellet or not. I must take control of my circumstance. Throw! I'm on my side. Always. That was a clip from The Favourite. Uh, Alfonso Curran's Roma is also a period piece. It's also the first Netflix film to be nominated for Best Picture 2. Everyone seems to love this. Um, yes, it's, it's definitely worth seeing, but was anybody actually clamoring for a meticulously designed Spanish-language black-and-white <laughs> visit to the director's 1970s childhood in a neighborhood called Roma in Mexico City? Roma is a very fine example of how ideas that don't sound as if anybody would actually want to sit down and watch them can win over audiences, and especially critics. But I'm in the minority here. I did not swoon. I liked it, but I wasn't bold over, and I actually saw the film under ideal conditions on a huge screen with a fabulous sound system in Vienna because it's only available to stream on Netflix on your home device here in France. Roma, interestingly, is nominated for Best Foreign Language Film as well as Best Picture. Which it will probably win, if nothing else. Now, the, Econ the Academy announced and then withdrew um, a proposed new category for popular films is because apparently they were terrified that Black Panther wouldn't get any nominations. Yes, these are the times we live in. I guess that particular fear can now be laid to rest. Phew. Ryan Coogler's planetary juggernaut with an all-black cast, based on a Marvel comic invented by two uh, white Jewish guys, by the way, got its nomination in the Best Picture category. But I have to say, in my opinion, that's ludicrous. The only place where Black Panther belongs in the running for Best Picture is on the imaginary planet of Wakanda. It's incredible box office success. That should be sufficient reward. Uh, the Best Picture category can have as many as 10 titles. This year there are eight based on a weighted voting process. I think that First Man, Damien Chazelle's portrait of Neil Armstrong, starring Ryan Gosling, should be on that list. It isn't. Uh, I love Vice, and I'm glad to see Bohemian Rhapsody acknowledged in five categories categories, including Best Picture and Actor. And one of my favorite films of last year, A Star is Born, received seven nominations. Yes, that is good news, uh, but one of them is for Best Adapted Screenplay, which suggests that the Academy may, may have been infested question. with the same sort of mind okay. control that somehow urges Tell Donald Trump to make decisions better. that Vladimir Putin will like. Um, we're all free to enjoy A Star is Born, but its weakest link by far is the script. Much of the dialogue must have been picked up at Cliches or Us, and there are narrative holes big enough to drive a roadies truck through. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, since we're in France, let's talk about how many films that premiered at the Cannes Film Festival have been nominated. Well, Spike Lee's outstanding fact-inspired story, Black Klansman, with six nominations, prepared, premiered in Cannes, and in the foreign language category, three of the five contenders premiered in Cannes. Shoplifters from Japan, which won the Palme d'Or, Cold War from Poland, and Kafarnum from Lebanon. I think the Icelandic film uh, Woman at War belongs in Kafarnum's slot, but that's just me. Okay, well, the Oscars will take place on the 24th of February. Um, one of the films with five Oscar nominations, including Best Picture, Actor, and Supporting Actor, is Green Book. Now, it's actually out in France this week. It's based on a true friendship between two very different people. Very different people. Viggo Mortensen plays Tony Lip, uh, an Italian-American man's man who works as a bouncer in his native Bronx, New York. Tony's a repository of racial, racial prejudice. I think Rachels are okay with him. Without realizing it, since racial animosity is simply par for the course in 1962, he gets hired by Don Shirley, played by Mahershala Ali. Now, whereas Tony is a walking stereotype, Don Doc Shirley is pretty unusual. He's a classically trained concert pianist. He studied at the conservatory in the Soviet Union, and he speaks eight languages. Uh, he lives in a lavish apartment atop Carnegie Hall. Uh, he's worldly and effete, but because he happens to be black, he needs Tony to be his driver and bodyguard for a trip through the Deep South, where Doc Shirley has a series of recitals lined up. OK, well, let's take a look at an exchange between the two protagonists. During a rest stop tour on tour, Tony hates being away from his wife. Falling in love with you was the easiest thing I've ever done. Nothing matters to me but you. And every day I'm alive, I'm aware of this. I loved you the day I met you. I love you today. And I will love you the rest of my life. So can I put a uh, P.S. kiss the kids? A P.S.? Yeah, like at the end. That's like clinging a cowbell at the end of Shostakovich's the seventh. Right. So that's good. It's perfect, Tony. So what is the green book in the title? Well, I had never heard of this crucial document, uh, a book put together by a U.S. postal worker listing hotels and restaurants in the segregated South where a non-white person could safely eat or sleep or put gas in their car or use a restroom. Uh, a matter of life and death, apparently. The full title is The Negro Motorist's Green Book. OK, well, Vigo Mortensen got into trouble, actually, for uttering the N-word in a public discussion about the film in November, didn't he? He did, and at the risk of stating like the obvious, thing. racism it's is bad, it's abhorrent. It's also a fact of history and of contemporary life. Mortensen did say the N-word, but he didn't call anybody you N-word you. Uh, Vigo Mortensen doesn't have a racist bone in his body, and he is the opposite of an insensitive boor. But taken out of context, what he said made n -bond headlines turn into pointlessly divisive clickbait. Well, Olivia Salazar-Winspear spoke to Viggo Mortensen and this is what he had to say about the manufactured controversy. What I was saying was that just because people don't say that word anymore, it doesn't mean that they don't still harbor discrimination, racism inside themselves. As the people who were in the room know, including Mahershala Ali and Peter Farrelly, the context in which I used the word, which is shocking to people still, especially coming from a white person, was to talk about the need for each generation to continue working because it does not disappear. It's something we always have to be wary of. That's what I was talking about. Solid entertainment, beautifully acted, intelligently structured, and a memorable portrait of how two men thrown together by circumstances form an at first wary partnership that actually deepens into friendship. See you. Okay. Green book, worth watching. Out in France this week is a documentary by Lily Feeney Zanuck about Eric Clapton, and it's called Life in 12 Bars. Tell us more. Well, you know, people assume that if you're a rock star, you can get absolutely any girl you set your eyes on, right? Well, one of the all-consuming tragedies of Clapton's life is that he was absolutely obsessed with Patty Boyd, who happened to be married to his best friend, George Harrison, who lived down the road. The outside world got the brilliant song Layla as a result of Clapton. Torment. Musicians' lives often involve substance abuse, or Clapton kicked heroin only to turn to drinking. He was soon down 
drinking a whole bottle of cognac before noon. I hope that scientists are studying cells from Keith Richards and uh, Eric Clapton because these guys should have been dead many times over and they've remained startlingly fine musicians. And the 12 bars of the title refer to a standard blues progression. Some people think that white folks can't play the blues because they haven't suffered like black people. Well, obviously there are exceptions. Clapton was lifelong friends with the great B.B. King who vouched for him and the film starts with him eulogizing his friend. Eric Clapton was an unlikely candidate to be a guitar god specializing in the blues, but he was smitten to the core by American blues music at a very young age, and this is a detail I absolutely love about what led him to him. Like lots of kids growing up in England, he listened to a radio program for children on weekend mornings where the host would toss in an American blues recording. He was hooked, bought all the blues records he could find, played along to them around the clock, became a professional uh, performer as a teenager when he came to play on a session with Aretha Franklin. She apparently cracked up with laughter. Once he started to play, of course, uh, it was obvious that his youth and his skin color were not obstacles to his artistry. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And we're going to leave you with that. Eric Clapton, Life in 12 Bars. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. I thought I had this dream, the perfect band, you know, the virtuoso. There was a way to turn this dreadful tragedy into something positive. There was always one man who was completely alone and with his guitar versus the world. <laughs> 